many of these are historic, but some, there are some that have significance from the, say, 20th century. And an example of that is um, there's one proverb called one corner of an ice mountain, which comes from uh, the tip of an iceberg, which is one of you know, our proverbs, if you will, as if to say, you know, the thing you see is only a small portion of the greater whole. And um, you can see the, the curious um, effect of the translation there, one tip of an ice mountain. You know, calling an iceberg an ice mountain is, you know, it's kind of a quaint translation, if you will. But that goes to show that was recent as well. So the translation between ancient Chinese proverbs into modern Chinese or, you know, and then into English or directly from the ancient Chinese into English, you know, there's, there's going to be some meaning that's lost. But I think for a lot of these, actually, you can deduce what they mean. I think that's part of the reason they've been included in this edition. So, you know, there's only 80 in here. We're going to be going through all of them in, in a two-part series. And that's probably why they've been included. And you know, the remaining um, 4,940 or what have you have been excluded. So I suppose I've talked about them enough. Let's read one, shall we? So I'm going to read the literal meaning and then the idiomatic meaning, and then sort of the, the context of it. So the first one is, um, sorrowing army must win. So of course, they're, they're four words, and they're direct translations of the, the four characters here. So you can see the four characters in Chinese. I don't read any Chinese. Um, you know, I know a little bit. I know ni hao is hello, and that's about it, really. And, and so... The sort of idiomatic meaning here is justice will prevail. And this one comes from um, Lao Zi, the author of the Tao Te Ching. Um, and he is the first to express this sort of sentiment. And so the term sorrowing, <clears throat> you know, it, it's not necessarily... It's the, un the feeling of injustice. Yeah. That, Those that's who like, are the victims of injustice. And that's what it says here. In fact, sorrowing, which is the direct translation of the character, um, it's that one there, if you're interested, um, is um, expanded into grieving with righteous indignation over injustice. And they say, this shows just how much meaning a single character can carry. So, you know, if you took it at face value, sorrowing, it might not be particularly profound. But knowing that it carries that weight, that, you know, people who are furious with injustice are more likely to prevail. People who have a righteous cause are more likely to prevail. Well, then the, the moral content of the proverb is a lot clearer, isn't it? It's that um, if you have a just cause, you're more willing to put your all into something because you feel that you are right. If you're doing something that you feel is wrong, you're less likely to have as much invested in it, and therefore it's more likely to fail. And that, that is perfectly wise as far as I'm concerned. It seems almost obvious. I think there is also an ambiguity, a hidden ambiguity in proverbs because, you know, statements that could be interpreted in all sorts of ways. So, for instance, what you described there seems to me to resemble the idea that the universe is fundamentally just mm -hmm. and that even if there are things that seem to be unjust, they are ultimately unjust only from our perspective and we should revolutionize our perspective or even if things are unjust they are ultimately won by a higher providence that mm -hmm. is just i did pick that up but i thought that it could also be sort of understood as just to say um you know in terms of the motivation of an individual with a just cause is more likely to to prevail than yeah. who isn't okay, right? yeah. And that's all you to need do to with have human a, motivation. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, in okay. typical fashion, I interpreted it like a psychologist. Okay. I mean, who'd have thought, eh? Funny things. So let's move on to the next one, shall we? Um, do stop me if you have more to say as well. Um, I'm not trying to power through them too quickly. Ban's door, use axe. Now this one is one of those ones where... Um, is this, does it have to do with fag life, with destroying doors or something? It does have to do with destroying doors. But the idiomatic meaning is teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Which, <laughs> <laughs> So 
this is one of those cases where there is a, a historic context which a Chinese person would be able to pick up on, but a Westerner might not. So Lu Ban, um, as it says here, was a semi-legendary craftsman who was highly skilled with an axe. This Cheng Yu was first used to describe aspiring poet who once visited the tomb of the great Tang Dynasty poet Li Bai, um, I think born in 701 and died in 762, and left an inscription of their own poems on the rock around it. The Ming scholar Mi uh, Ji Huan said it was like showing off with an axe outside Lu Ban's door. This saying can either be used to criticize someone else's actions or to politely belittle one's own efforts in comparison to another. So basically the poet and went to an esteemed poet's grave and wrote their own poems and they weren't very good. And it's, it, it's a, um, that's the example he's given to contextualize this one. And so Ban was a legendary craftsman, uh, Lu Ban. And if you're showing off with an axe, you're not going to impress him because he's better. And there's a sort of um, clear message of humility here, isn't there? It's to say there's going to be someone better than you, so don't show off especially don't show off to people who are better than you at something. Mm. And to be humble, not to write poems at an esteemed poet's grave because you're just trying to latch onto their esteem rather than earn it for yourself. This seems like a condemnation of pride. It is. Because you could extent. say that yeah. you know, pride makes you think you're infallible and uh, pride also breeds the illusion of omnipotence. And when you're proud, you think that you're basically not under threat. Mm -hmm. And it cometh before the fall as yeah. well. It's uh, one of the major deadly sin in Christianity, and I think there's a good reason for that. It took me a long time, actually. And not only in Christianity. Of course, yeah. And uh, it took me a long time, actually, to, to think, why is pride bad? Because it's not, you know, sloth, envy, yeah. greed. Yeah. You know, all of these things make intuitive sense. But then I'm just like, you know, being proud of your own actions can sometimes be good, right? And then I realized, oh, right, it's, it's in excess, right? I, I think the excess bit is very important because on the other hand, I completely dislike the idea that, you know, we're totally worthless and anything good that happens to us happens because of good luck. And I don't believe in luck in the first I, place. There's I no think, such thing. I think that um, basically telling, telling ourselves that, you know, we did good when we actually did good it's a good thing. It's not being proud. But well, uh, when, I, we start, when we think that basically we're infallible, that we cannot be, do wrong, that mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're not under threat, that anything we do is by definition right because we do it, we do it, or anything we think is right because we think it, I think that's, uh, that's a, a very big problem because it completely sabotages all self-improvement. Olympics it does, yeah. Well, it, it says that I know everything. I'm perfect. Yeah. Um, I don't need to change, and no one ever reaches that point. And yeah. you can always improve. Um, it might just be beyond your awareness how you can improve. And I think that that's also a sort of sentiment trapped in there, isn't it? And let's have a look at another one, shall we? So, half road, then stop. Yeah, and it, it sounds like it's translated into broken just, English, but it's um. Uh, basically, take a break. Huh? Take a break. Not quite. It's, um, <laughs> okay. The idiotic meanings are you give up too easily, leave something half done, or if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well, or doing right would be yeah. the way I would say it. Um, so there is an equivalent here. And apparently this, apparently, I'm saying apparently a lot here. I'm like that, that kid at the fair that got interviewed. <laughs> I'm referencing a meme, sorry. Um, and they say, this comes from a parable told by a grandson of Confucius, um, the philosopher ZC, um, born in 481 and died in 402, so that's going to be BC. Um, in this book, The Doctrine of the Mean, a man went off to the city to study, but decided it was too difficult and came home after only a year. His wife was very cross with him. She had been weaving a piece of fine cloth for many months. And on her husband's return, she cut it into pieces. He asked her why she had wasted so many months' work. She replied that it was just the same as him giving up his studies halfway through. If something is worth doing, you must be prepared to spend time on it. I mean, the sentiment there is pretty obvious, isn't it? That yeah. you don't get good at something by giving up easily. Yeah, there is a significant amount of uh, habituation that goes on in excellence. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
Oh, Can don't I know it? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm joking. That would be prideful, wouldn't it? I wouldn't do that. Yeah. And we, we have a saying that um, goods are conquered with toil. And I think it, it's something, it's similar to its meaning. I think you have to work really hard to achieve something and that thing be a, a lasting good for your life. I think it's all about how... Otherwise, we, it's like a castle in sand. Mm, that sort of thing. I think it's about how we process value, isn't it? If, if something is difficult for us to do, then it's more valuable because there's more effort expended in achieving it. Is because value ultimately is the, the scarcity of something. And if, you, if it's difficult, then it means that it's probably going to be more scarce in the world than something easy. Like it's harder to climb a mountain than it is to have a drink of water. So it makes sense that um, it's more of an achievement, it's more valuable to climb a mountain than to have a sip of water. Um, in, in, if you're looking for purely in terms of achievement, if you're dehydrated, obviously the water is more important than climbing a mountain. But I'm, I'm going to stop looking at these sorts of things literally. We're all in proverbial senses now. So the next one is glass bow snake image. So Please, could you say more or <laughs> elaborate? So to, to start at a shadow is the idiomatic meaning, or always be looking over your shoulder. Yeah. And... It says here, this is one of those Cheng Yu that is completely incomprehensible until it is explained. <laughs> you don't say. A man hadn't seen one of his friends for some time and heard from another acquaintance that the friend was too scared to return after his last visit. Apparently he had seen a reflection of a snake in a cup of wine he had been drinking and was afraid the snake might still be there. After some thought, the man realized that the reflection of a bow hanging on his wall might have caught on the surface of the wine and looked like a snake. So he immediately reassured his friend. So it, it, it has a sort of almost fable-like quality to it. You can imagine Aesop talking about a man who thought he saw a snake in a cup. But actually, it was a reflection and that he got caught up in his emotions. You know, his initial emotional reaction stopped him from being rational in a more long-term sense. Yeah. That's kind of the impression I'm getting from this one. What, what do you think about no, it? No, th I think you're right. Yeah. So yeah, it's... It, it could have been expressed in a more concise way in English, but I suppose the four terms are simple enough in, in the Chinese that people will know what fable it's referring to. It might yeah. be like the equivalent of, um, you could say, it's like slow and steady wins the race. It calls to mind Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare, doesn't it? So you think, hang on a minute, it's a race. But you're going slowly. How can it win? But it's, it's about the, the moral, of, obviously, is doing something right, isn't it? Yes. You do something well, do it right. It, it reminds me of the basics in everything. And I remember that, for instance, in martial arts, there are lots of people who start martial arts and you know, we want to say, okay, I want to learn everything. I want to learn all the kicks right now. But you need to perfect the basics first to do all the moves well. Yes, yeah, you've got to work on the fundamentals i know when i did boxing just getting the left jab right yeah was like all i focused on for ages yeah and getting the feet right and getting everything right and, you know i only did um one twos for you know the first few months of boxing before i even moved on to other punches and, and throwing you know the other eight well it's eight in total but the other six into my sort of combinations and there's obviously a lot of wisdom there because that's how human beings progress in terms of skill. We get a really solid foundation in something and then slowly progress in complexity. Yeah. And you know, sometimes it can be a snowball effect and you get better and better quicker and quicker. Sometimes it can be diminishing returns depending on the domain in question, I suppose. So the next one is forced to climb Mount Liang which is uh, the idiomatic meaning is necessity is the mother of invention. Take the only possible course of action or be driven to extremes. It says here, the marshes around Mount Liang in the Shandong province, north of China, are renowned for being the home of the bandits and outlaws made famous in the great Chinese novel, uh, Xiu Hu Zihong. There you go. Uh, not bad. Um, novel best known in English as The Water Margin, which eventually I'm going to be reading. 
Um, it's one of the, the four great novels of Chinese literature. I've read The Three Kingdoms already, which is fantastic, by the way. I need to talk about that at some point. Um, which was written in the 14th century, and it tells the story of 108 heroes forced into hiding and exile by the injustice of local government under the Song Dynasty of 960 to 1279. The heroes are the Chinese equivalent of Robin Hood and his Merry Men. Some of the characters are the most popular in Chinese literature. So there you go. That's one that would be quite difficult. So basically, they're, they're driven up to, to hide in this mountain known for banditry and obviously it's it's because of injustice because of hardship and it's the only thing they could have done and that's more or less to say that you know you've got to do this thing to survive to do well yes that's my understanding of the phrase to watch the full video please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com